So today we're going to be talking about special relativity. In particular, we're going to be talking about an effect called time dilation, uh, which comes, as do all the effects of special relativity, uh, from the two fundamental postulates of special relativity. The first is the principle of relativity. What the principle of relativity says is that the laws of physics hold for all inertial reference frames. This might seem kind of obvious. An inertial reference frame, by the way, is a, a frame of reference that is moving at a constant velocity. So there's no acceleration, no turning, and no speeding up or slowing down. Uh, so what this means is that if I'm in an airplane, right, and I take a ball and throw it really high, it's a really tall airplane, and I throw it really, really high up, it's not going to go backwards. It's going to come straight back down to me. Because since it's an, iner an inertial reference frame, the laws of physics will behave as they should. I throw a ball up, it comes straight back down. Um, the second one is not so expected. It's uh, that the speed of light, which we denote as c, is constant. Uh, they say that Einstein uh, came up with this. Part of what uh, motivated him to, to come up with this was that he pictured himself traveling at the speed of light next to a beam of light. And of course, if you're moving at the same velocity as something next to you, it looks like you're both staying still. And frozen light to him seemed wrong, so he was like, ah, maybe it, 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 it is constant uh, in all reference frames. It, it can't ever be, be zero. Um, in the speed of light, uh, in a vacuum, you can derive the velocity of it, uh, and it is about 3 times 10 to the 8th. Um, but the fact that it's constant in all inertial, in all reference frames, is very interesting. You'll see some of the effects of that in a little bit. So, let's look at what happens if uh, we're interested in, in, in time effects. And the first thing we're going to look at is called the relativity of simultaneity. Simultaneous events are, would be like me standing in the middle of the room and throwing a ball at both sides of the, uh, of the room. And we're going to do something like that, but with light. So, let's say we have a train, and uh, we're going to be using a trains a lot. They're easy to visualize. Um, you know, they're pretty straightforward, uh, and they're easy to draw, which is awesome. Um, and the train is moving to the right with a velocity that we'll call v. Uh, we're going to look at the train from two different frames of reference. The first one is going to be called, uh, well, we'll be inside the train. So I'm going to stand inside the train while it's moving at constant velocity, and watch as this double-sided flashlight shoots out a photon towards the front of the train and towards the back of the train. And it will do this at some time t equals zero. Now, a photon is a, a particle of light. So recall that light has uh, wave-like properties and particle-like properties, so we're going to be using the particle description here. Um, so at t equals 1, one second later, we've got the train still, obviously, and uh, now the light's moved a little bit further. And at t equals 2, we'll say that the light hits the front of the train and hits the back of the train, and that these two events, hitting the back and hitting the front, occur at the same time. Thus, they are simultaneous. Now, it would appear, it would seem, that if they're simultaneous in this frame of reference, they must be simultaneous in all the other frames of reference. But, when you take into account special relativity, we're going to see that that actually isn't always the case. So, Let's take another set of uh, no, the same train, actually, uh, and this time I'm standing outside of it, watching it go by at some velocity. So this the t equals zero is still the same. We still have the photon pop out of the front and the back, but then at t equals one, things change because now the trains move forwards. So now there's some small difference in the train train's location relative to what I'm seeing. So, also remember, the speed of light is constant. If we were doing this with Newtonian classical mechanics, uh, the light would get a little boost, it would have the velocity of the light would be added to the velocity of the train, and we would see it just the exact same thing as over here happen again. But remember that the speed of light has to be constant, which means the velocity of the train does not get added to it. Therefore, the light will continue to emerge from there, even though the flashlight is now here. So that means that we have something that looks like this, with the photon reaching there. And then, the train moves even more to the right at t equals 2, and now we have the photon in the back hitting the back of the train, and the photon in front not quite reaching the front of the train. Uh, so 
In this frame of reference, the events are not simultaneous. How can this be? Uh, well, this would suggest that, in fact, special relativity has an effect on time in different frames of reference. So let's try to come up with a quantitative way to relate time in one frame to time in another frame. So we're going to get rid of this, and we're going to draw a new train. Uh, because like I said, special relativists love trains. So uh, this train is going to be a little bit different. We're going to have uh, still a rectangle, you know, because trains are rectangles. Um, and we're going to put a mirror on the top of the train and a mirror on the bottom of the train. And we're going to bounce a photon from the bottom up to the top and then back down to the bottom. And this train will be moving at a velocity v to the right. Now, we're going to again look at it from the frame of reference of the person inside the train and outside the train. And just to refer to these frames by a name, I'm going to call the frame inside the train, um, I'm going to erase that, eh? no, I won't. Uh, inside the train, S prime. So, inside the train, what we're going to have is we're going to have the two mirrors, one on top, one on the bottom, and bounce a photon up and down. So the photon will go up, hit the top mirror, and then come back down and hit the bottom one. Very straightforward, just what you'd expect. It's inside an inertial frame of reference, just very easy. Um, we're going to say that the length between the mirrors is going to be some distance called L. And that means that the total amount of time the photon spends traveling up and down uh, is going to be equal to the distance traveled over the velocity. So the distance traveled is 2L, L up and L down, and the velocity is always C. So that means that T prime is equal to 2L divided by C. Notice that I'm using T prime to match the, uh, the notation of the reference frame we're in. In the next one, I'm going to use T because this is going to be in the S frame. Oops, S frame. Now, the S frame is going to be a little bit different because in the S frame, the photon leaves the bottom mirror. But when it goes to the top mirror, the trains move to the right, which means that the top mirror is now over here. And then, when it goes down again, the bottom mirror will have moved over here, which means that the photon is going to be taking a triangular path. Now, you might wonder, well, why doesn't the photon just hit the roof and not miss it? I thought that the speed of light was constant. It is, and that's actually why this happens. So, in here, when the light starts, its velocity is upward. And the velocity of the train does not get added to the component of uh, velocity of the light that's in the same direction. But if the speed of light, uh, if the light is traveling up, it has no velocity in the horizontal direction. But it does have a velocity because you have the velocity of the train. But the speed of light has to remain constant, which means that the light will have some horizontal component, still have a vertical component, but the vertical component will be less. So you add them together, and you're going to get some angle like that to the right. So then you still have the speed of light is constant. So this distance from the top mirror to the ground is still L. And we're going to call the distance uh, here D. So that means that the amount of time the light takes to travel is going to be equal to 2D divided by C. Now, this is a right triangle. And in physics, we like right triangles because it makes math much easier. So we just need this last leg here. How can we get that? Um, well, the distance the mirrors are going to travel, the mirrors on the bottom, is going to be the uh, velocity of the train, which is V, times the amount of time it was traveling, which is T. And if we only want one of the legs, we're going to divide it by 2. Since Vt is this length, Vt over 2 will be that. So now we can use the Pythagorean theorem to relate the lengths of the three sides. So we have, we have Vt over 2 all squared plus L squared is equal to D squared. And over here, we can solve for D. And we have that D is equal to CT over 2. Now, I just want to remind you at this point what it is we're trying to do. We're trying to come up with a relationship between the amount of time passing in this reference frame and the amount of time passing in this reference frame, or that, that each individual in this reference frame observes uh, if afterwards they were to compare watches. They compare their watches and see how much, what do our watches say? They're going to be off, maybe. We're going to calculate that and see if they are. So, uh, we're going to plug CT over 2 over in here, and we're going to get VT over 2 squared plus L squared is equal to 
ct over 2 all squared. And then we can subtract the ct over 2 from both sides. So uh, actually, we're going to subtract the vt over 2 squared from both sides, because remember that c is uh, the speed of light. You can't go faster than it. Um, and uh, v is less than that, so we'll subtract that way. So we're going to get that l squared is equal to ct over 2 squared minus vt over 2 squared. And I'm just going to flip the sides of this equation just because I feel like it. Um, and we're going to pull out a t over 2 squared from this side here. So we're going to have uh, t over 2 all squared times c squared minus v squared. And this equals l squared. So we can solve for t now by dividing both sides by the c squared minus v squared, and then multiplying by 2 squared and taking the square root. So we're going to have uh, t is equal to, we have l squared divided by this, but remember we're taking the square root of the whole thing, so the square root of l squared is l, and we're going to have a 4 up there, and the square root of 4 is 2, so we're going to have 2l divided by the square root of that, which is the square root of c squared minus v squared. But, I mean, this is nice, but it's problematic because it doesn't tell us anything. It doesn't tell us what the relationship is between the two frames of reference. So, take a look at this for a moment. See if you can find a way that we could get a t prime, which is the amount of time passing in this reference frame, into that equation. And pause the video if you want. Just take a look and see if you can figure it out. So, what we're going to do is, uh, the t prime over here is equal to 2l divided by c. So, we're going to pull a c out of this. Now, also remember that if you have a radical like this, um, we can, well, first we'll pull it up. So we have that t is equal to 2l divided by the square root, and we're going to pull out a c squared. So you have c squared times, a c squared pulled out of a c squared is a 1, minus a c squared pulled out of a v squared is a v squared over c squared. And if you don't believe me, redistribute this. c squared times 1 is c squared c squared uh, times negative v squared over c squared, the c squareds cancel, and you get c squared minus v squared, what you had over there. And remember that the radical of a product is the same as uh, the radical of the first times the radical of the second, which means we can pull out the c squared and it will become a c. So that means that this is equal to, um, I'll write it on the next line, uh, it means that t is equal to 2l divided by c times the square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared. And 2l over c t prime, which means that this is equal to t prime divided by the square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared. And this equation, this is equal to t, this equation is uh, the equation of time dilation. Now dilate means just to stretch out, right, to get bigger. And time is stretched and dilated because in the moving frame of reference, moving clocks will move slowly compared to one that is at rest relative to itself. So, why don't we see this in our everyday lives then? The key is in this v squared over c squared term. Because let's say you're traveling down the highway at 30 meters per second. That's about 60 or 70 miles per hour. So, 30 meters per second is going to be your velocity, and we'll plug that in. And 30 squared is going to be 900. So you have 900 divided by, the speed of light is 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. 3 times 10 to the 8th squared is 9 times 10 to the 16th. That's a really big number. So you have 900 divided by 3 times 10, uh, 9 times 10 to the 16th power. Really small over really big. Basically, it's about zero, which means you have t is equal to t prime divided by the square root of 1 minus about zero, which means that this is t prime over about 1, and t is about t prime, and we don't notice it in our everyday lives. Um, and that is uh, one of the effects of special relativity when you take into account the two fundamental postulates there. Um, and as you'll see if you watch some of the other videos, there are a lot of other really interesting effects that come out of these postulates. Uh, but time dilation is definitely one of the most interesting and one of the most uh, unexpected.